The Red Sox offense explodes to score 13 runs on Sunday to get the series win against the Kansas City Royals. You are locked on Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to welcome you back into the Locked On Red Sox podcast. And thank you so much for making Locked On Red Sox your first listen of every single day. I am your host, Massachusetts Pirates team insider and Woo Sox production assistant, Jake Ignazuski. And if you're watching the video version, you see that I'm wearing a Tom Brady Patriots jersey. If you're listening to the audio version, now you know what I'm wearing. But it was nice to see not only the Red Sox get a win on Sunday, but also a nice win for the Patriots. But this is a Red Sox podcast, so we're going to be talking about the great series win that the Red Sox had against the Kansas City Royals. You know, we saw them win 2-1 to on Friday, then fall on Saturday 9 to nothing in a pretty tough loss. And then the offense exploded to score 13 runs on Sunday. And, you know, when you really look at sort of the box score or if you just look at the score in general, think in your mind the Red Sox probably got a few home runs, few doubles, found ways to get ducks on the pond enough to score 13 runs. Well, no home runs. But they got nine doubles and 20 hits against the Kansas City Royals to, as I mentioned, score 13 runs. And it was three guys who really came up huge for this Red Sox offense in the Sunday win. Tommy Pham, Rafael Devers, and Reese McGuire all combined for 10 total hits and eight RBIs. And, you know, we're going to start off with Reese McGuire, who has been so clutch for the Red Sox since coming over uh, from the White Sox in the trade deadline. And this trade is ultimately looking looking like a steal right now. You know, obviously they traded Diekman, who is a little bit unreliable as a reliever, and then also had a one year of control with the Red Sox. But Boston was able to unload that, get Reese McGuire, who was able to replace Christian Vasquez at that catcher position. And then also they got pitcher Taylor Broadway as well. And it, we, we also had the opportunity to speak with newly acquired uh, Red Sox pitcher Taylor Broadway and posted that interview just a few days ago. And so if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, the other piece that the Red Sox got in the Reese McGuire trade in Taylor Broadway, you can go over and listen to that. But McGuire's been hitting 349 over 71 up at bat since being traded over to the Red Sox and only has one home run. So it's been really impressive to see him be very consistent in getting on base and, you know, finding ways to, you know, get into the gaps, get some uh, soft bloopers as well as get some nice hard line drives. But he's somebody that has consistently been very clutch for the Red Sox. And he's, he's really putting himself into a great position for 2023. The Red Sox have him under control until 2025, but especially with that catcher position being wide open, and it's sort of a race right now between Connor Wong and Reese McGuire, it's ultimately going to look like probably a platoon at that catcher position between those two players. But McGuire's looking like the sure front runner to uh, be the starting catcher for the Red Sox come uh, opening day of 2023. But also Tommy Pham, as I mentioned Also had a really great game for the Red Sox. Ended up going three for four at that leadoff position with three RBIs. Also walking ones. And Rafael Devers, four for six with three RBIs. It seems like ever since he came out of that slump a week and a half or so ago, he has just caught fire in finding ways to really be able to help the Red Sox uh, get the guys moving in runners in scoring position and finding ways to help them ultimately score runs. J.D. Martinez, you know, Lauren and I have, you know, harped on this a lot throughout uh, this season. He's had a tough time coming up clutch with runners in scoring position. He ended up having a two for four game as well. And then, you know, we also saw a uh, newly acquired infielder, Yu Chang, uh, get in on the action smacking an RBI double. He ultimately went two for three in this game. Has looked mediocre up to this point. Only played a few games for the Red Sox so far, but he's auditioning for a spot on the 2023 roster. So it'll be interesting to see 
how much of an impact he can really make for the Red Sox over these last few games and ultimately try and uh, convince Bloom to keep him on the roster for 2023. But Ultimately, a really nice day offensively, as I mentioned, 20 overall hits. And this was only the seventh time on the season that the offense has scored double digits. And, you know, another guy who really came up big for the team is Xander Bogart. He became the fourth player in team history to log 1,400 hits before his 30th birthday. And, you know, even though the power has not been there, He's still been one of the most consistent and clutch batters in the league so far this season and ultimately could win the batting title for how high of a batting average he currently has on the season. And it's just continuing to give the Red Sox multiple reasons on why they should re-sign him after this season if he ultimately does opt out. And it's really nice to see as well, you know, not only the offense playing well against the Royals, but also on the pitching side, really doing a nice job of being locked down throughout today. Nick Pavetta was on the mound, ended up pitching five innings, seven hits, three earned runs with seven strikeouts, also walked two batters. This is sort of a, a normal start for Nick Pavetta. You, you know, you sort of, uh, when you see his name etched into uh, that slot of, of being the upcoming starter, you sort of have in your mind, he's going to allow two to three runs. You know, he, he might, he might implode sometimes. He might allow, you know, five to six runs here or there, but that's not really consistently uh, what we've seen from Nick Pavetta. And, you know, it bodes well for his ERA too. It's, it's around 435. That, that's sort of what you expect from a guy like Nick Pavetta. So it was nice to see him, you know, not allow too many runs, but also be able to be locked down with those seven strikeouts. And ultimately, the bullpen ended up helping him out, only surrendering one hit throughout four innings over four different pitchers and also just walking one guy. But it was really nice to see, you know, Caleb Ort, John Schreiber, Matt Strom, and Matt Barnes shut it down for the Red Sox and not really allow too much trouble, obviously, uh, with the amount of a lead that the Red Sox ultimately did have. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't too much of a nail biter that, you know, the bullpen could ultimately blow it. But, you know, we've seen that throughout this season. So it was nice to see uh, some very good outings out there on the mound for the Red Sox bullpen. But ultimately, just a great overall win for this team. And, you know, if you didn't have the opportunity to watch Saturday's game, as I mentioned, the Red Sox ultimately lost 9 nothing. We don't really got to talk too much about this game. It was sort of a blowout, unfortunately, for the team. Uh, Rich Hill ultimately ended up uh, allowing four earned runs over four and two-thirds. And then Frank Herman had his uh, long-awaited Red Sox Major League debut. Did not go how anybody really expected, especially myself. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in our second segment on, on his thoughts of his debut. But I was somebody who harped on Herman being called up pretty much over a month and a half or so now, you know, really hoping and praying that the Red Sox would let go either Ryan Brazier or um, Jesus Familia. And ultimately, obviously, we saw Familia ended up getting uh, let go. But it was unfortunate to see that Kevin Ploiecki uh, was the corresponding move for Herman to ultimately come up to the majors. We're going to talk a little bit about that move, as I mentioned, a little bit more in the second segment. But Herman ultimately ended up allowing four earned runs, walking two batters, didn't end up getting out of the inning. It was tough to see from that. Uh, from, from his first performance in a Red Sox uniform up in the majors. But at the end of the day, nothing to really panic about. He's still very young, just made his debut, has a lot of learning to do. So, you know, the more innings that he gets under his belt, sort of like we saw with Bayo, he just needs to get comfortable. He has the talent there. But luckily, at the same time, it's not like the Red Sox are really losing out on anything if he doesn't work out ultimately, you know, next year or for the future. The Red Sox sort of got Herman as a throw-in player uh, in the Adam Adovino trade. They essentially got this guy for free. And so, you know, if he does work out, it's going to be a huge win uh, for the Red Sox. And so hopefully, you know, he he's able to bounce back in his future starts. But then also on Friday, we saw the Red Sox squeak out a win, 2-1 to one, against the Royals in that first game. Nothing really too much to talk about really in this game other than Michael Walker continuously being able to show up when the Red Sox need him to on the mound. Ended up going seven innings strong, only allowing seven hits and striking out four. And 
you know, it, it's come out over the past week or so that, you know, the Red Sox and Michael Waka are, are very interested in talking about a return for Waka. Uh, he, he is still on a one-year contract. The Red Sox signed him for $7 million at the uh, beginning of this season. And so hopefully the Red Sox are able to find a way to extend Waka, who has ultimately been one of the most consistent pitchers in this Red Sox rotation. You could even really call him the ace. Uh, but who knows if he's going to be able to replicate what he did uh, in this season. But, you know, at the end of the day, we can just be grateful that he's uh, really worked out so far for the Red Sox and, and really ultimately been a massive steal for this team and one of the best uh, signings from this past offseason. But it's great to see the Red Sox get a series win, even though it doesn't really matter. It's just fun to see the Red Sox playing well. You know, it's been a tough season so far uh, throughout the 2022 campaign and lots of ups and downs, but I'm just really grateful that, you know, we have two more weeks of Red Sox baseball to enjoy. So all we can really do is just be excited when they do well and can't really be too, too upset if they don't do great because it doesn't really matter since they're not making the playoffs. But if you want to continue to bet on the Red Sox throughout this season in these remaining games and hope and pray that they finish the uh, season strong, Bet Online is your number one source uh, for all your betting needs, whether it's Major League Baseball or pro or college football. Now that is in season. Find all the latest football league developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including this year's opening week's games. Bet Online is also your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online where the game starts. So as I mentioned in the first segment, we're going to be speaking a little bit about uh, the Kevin Pluwecki, uh move where he got designated for an assignment. There was some interesting reactions from Rich Hill and Nathan Valdi. I so, sort of wanted to give my reaction to that. But before we do that, I already talked a little bit about Frank Herman's debut. Didn't go as well as he really expected. He talked a little bit about uh, his reaction to his tough outing, saying, after the game, I keep my head up. I'm going to get more opportunities to show what I can do, you know, just learn from it. And I, I, he said, I feel pretty good. I don't feel like I was too jacked up or like out of control. I just didn't feel like I executed like I wanted to. And that was one of the biggest things that I noticed from Herman's debut is uh, he, he really left a lot of pitches out in the middle of the zone. That's what you got to understand and really get used to uh, compared to AAA in the majors. Uh, when you make mistakes on pitches and if they, if they don't go exactly where you want it to and, you know, it's, it's a little bit more over the plate uh, than you would like, maybe in AAA you'll get a guy to – ground out fly out or you you know softly get out but in the majors a guy's gonna hit it for a ride they're gonna get some hard contact so that's one thing that with the competitive difference i, I think is going to be really crucial for Haman to you know go into his second outing look at the film understand where he went wrong find ways to be a little bit more effective with uh where he's placing his pitches and i think that at the end of the day not too much to panic about still has a lot of time to be able to show what he has not only this season but hopefully he'll get the chance next season and you know if he doesn't he'll start the year in triple a and as i mentioned in the first segment it's not too much of a loss you know the red Sox got him for free but it was unfortunate to see kevin Puecki, as i mentioned get designated for an assignment a guy who even though with the bat hasn't really done anything for the Red Sox throughout this season, uh, was one of the main clubhouse guys throughout the 2021 uh, playoff run, really uh, helped start the Dancing on My Own song. And, uh, you know, it also came out that the Red Sox were playing that in the clubhouse uh, after the game to, on Sunday to sort of commemorate uh, what uh, Kevin Puecki really meant to the Red Sox clubhouse. And he was somebody who also uh, came up with the home run card idea and, it's somebody who you heard throughout the organization was loved and was respected and somebody who all the guys really appreciated with what he did in the clubhouse as a clubhouse presence. And, you know, Nathan Rivaldi was somebody who was really upset about this. He said, unfortunately, I had already left. I didn't realize that we were going to be letting him go. It was a shock to me. He's one of the teammates that you want in the clubhouse. I said, I understand it's a tough decision. But you want to build a championship around guys like that. And then this is something that, you know, really made headlines and made a lot of uh, 
people really think that he was kind of going after Heim Bloom, saying we had guys like Kyle Schwarber last year and Hunter Renfro and certain guys like that. They are the guys that do the little things right on and off the field, especially when you're in the clubhouse. And I, this is something that, you know, fans were really upset about. Obviously, Kyle Schwarber, Hunter Renfro, two guys that made such a huge impact for the Red Sox during the 2021 playoff run. And I completely understand where Evaldi's coming from. Now, the thing is with, with Pulecki, even though he's a great clubhouse guy, you know, he was somebody who was so crucial for the Red Sox during 2021. And, you know, especially now, like, I, I understand – where he might be a little bit upset that they let him go a little bit early because he could be a great person to mentor the younger guys, help them get acclimated to the majors. And uh, that clubhouse guy that you want, especially during such a down season that it's been. And so I understand that they wanted to finish the season out with him. But at the same time, what was he really given to you? He wasn't giving you anything offensively, at least, and defensively either. He's, he's one of the worst defensive catchers in the entire league, especially when you look at uh, the amount of times that he's been able to throw runners out. And at the same time, you got two great catchers in Connor Wong and Reese McGuire, who are ultimately going to be the two catchers uh, for the Red Sox starting 2023. And so I understand why they made the move. And especially when you want to look at a guy like Frank Herman to see what he really has, uh, that's some of the corresponding moves that you really need to make. But I understand where they're coming from, especially like a guy like Nathan Navaldi, who, who spent a lot of time with Kevin Puecki, you know, not only preparing for games, but also throughout the last two or three years, really getting to know him and, and see what, how much of an impact he's really made for the, this Red Sox team. So I, I understand him being upset uh, that, you know, uh, they, they let him go with, without him knowing. And, you know, he left the stadium without being able to say bye to him. But um I did find it interesting that he brought up, you know, Kyle Schwarber and Hunter Renfro. So, you know, that's a perfect indication that uh, these guys still are not over the Red Sox, uh, not only trading Hunter Renfro, uh, but not re-signing Kyle Schwarber. And this is something that, you know, we heard be talked about a little bit during the trade deadline on how, you know, players are getting really frustrated with the uh, non-willingness of the front office to go after it and fully believe that this team is a championship team. And, you know, maybe looking at some of the moves that you saw from the Red Sox during the offseason and also during the trade deadline that Heimblum didn't go all in. He, he, he didn't make the moves necessary to really help this team be a championship contender. You know, obviously, we saw what happened with the injuries. You know, that, that's, uh, that's not forgotten. But at the same time, you know, some of these guys – definitely would have liked to see the Red Sox go after a little bit more uh, this season. And, you know, it probably would have been even worse reaction if they, uh, if they ultimately ended up, you know, trading a guy like Janie Martinez or Nathan Avaldi. But, you know, obviously if they trade Nathan Avaldi, he wouldn't be here to make that comment. But also we heard Rich Hill say uh, what everyone sees out on the field and in the dugout is not fully the full picture. Uh, people don't realize uh is the humanity side of it. We're not just all the numbers, we're human beings. And removing a guy like that from the clubhouse is a big hit for a lot of guys. I would say for everybody in here. And so, you know, hearing from a guy like Rich Hill, who's only been on this team for one season, it's really interesting to hear that on, you know, how the how Kevin Pulecki impacted him and, you know, the the impact that he saw Pulecki have in the clubhouse for this team. And, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a little bit indifferent on this because, you know, the on-field performance for Pulecki was abysmal throughout this season. He, he really gave you nothing. Um, but, you know, who knows what really uh, the impact that he gave behind closed doors to this Red Sox team, especially during those tough times, especially during those injuries. Uh, he was probably one of the main guys to uh, really help motivate them and uh, have that passion going out there, especially when things weren't going their way. So, would, you know, some players have liked to see him finish off the season with the team? Yes, but at the same time, the front office still needs to start looking towards 2023. And they probably saw Frank Herman in those sort of plans and Kevin Pawlaki not in those plans. And, you know, that that's something that, you know, we've heard fans talk about, you know, throughout this second half is start planning for 2023. Start getting guys up here so we can get a glimpse and start allowing guys to have auditions. And Frank Herman's a guy who... You know, not only myself, but other people in, you know, Red Sox media or Red Sox Twitter have been harping for him to come up here. And, you know, then you also see people who are upset about the Kevin Puecki 
designated for assignment. And, you know, it, it's just a double-edged sword sometimes. But also at the same time, you also saw people very upset that Pulecki did nothing to really help out this team offensively or defensively throughout this season. So it's really interesting to see once guys do get let go, uh, the outcry of people who are like, oh, no, I loved him. You know, why did they let him go? Like, I, I get the clubhouse aspect of it, but at the same time, as I've said time and time again, you know, did nothing on the field. And so, you know, we've seen examples of, you know, other guys who, you know, ha have left and, you know, people harped on them uh, being released or traded. And then once they're gone, oh, my God, are you kidding me right now? So, you know, that that's just something that – um I feel like Red Sox are getting a little Red Sox fans are getting a little bit more accustomed to not having those staples on the team and you know having guys uh leave here and there but at the same time that that also brings up a great point of Heimbloom really needs to keep a focus on keeping these clubhouse staples, not Kevin Puecki in specific, but, you know, guys like obviously Xander Bogards, um, Rafael Devers, those sort of clubhouse staples, those, those uh, players that are really going to be able to help bring a clubhouse together. And, you know, Tommy Pham has seemed like a guy who's been a great clubhouse guy so far. So maybe maybe that could be a great indication that he stays. But you really got to have uh, a great core. And, you know, that, that this is something that we've talked about, you know, throughout this season is being able to have those guys, uh, you know, that not only some of those young guys, but some of those free agents can look to to understand uh, how things go in Boston, playing in Boston, you know, getting used to, uh, you know, a new team or a new environment. And um, this is something that Heimblum really needs to focus on. And, you know, obviously we, we heard from, you know, guys, a guy like Nathan Valdi uh, that allowing some of those uh, clubhouse staples or those great clubhouse guys like Kyle Schwarber, Hunter Renfro, Kevin Pulecki go w was a big hit on the clubhouse. So, you know, you know, we'll see even if Evaldi's on the team next year, but also uh, what, what Han Bloom will do during this off season to, you know, build that uh, clubhouse camaraderie once again, and, and be able to have those staples in that clubhouse for, that guys can look to. But, Another thing that I wanted to talk about before we end this uh, episode of the Lockdown Red Sox podcast is that former Red Sox pitcher David Price has announced his retirement from Major League Baseball. Obviously, he's been playing for the Los Angeles Dodgers uh, since he was traded after the 2019 season in the Mookie Betts trade. And Price was somebody who had an up and down Red Sox career. You know, obviously, he's, he signed with the Sox in 2016, and, you know, as I mentioned, was traded in 2019. But Honestly, other than sort of his trouble with the media and, you know, obviously with Dennis Eckersley, that whole weird thing that happened, uh, he was one of the MVPs of the Red Sox winning the World Series in 2018. Had had one of the best performances, not only throughout the playoffs, but in the World Series. And, uh, you know, that's, that's something that, like, when you pay a guy $30 million, you're not only expecting him to come up big throughout the regular season, but playoffs is when it matters most. And obviously the World Series is when it matters the absolute most. And so having a guy like David Price, who had those ups and downs throughout his Red Sox career, come up when the Red Sox really needed it during that 2018 World Series, really helped not only myself, but Red Sox fans all around the country gain massive respect for David Price. And you know, really looking at the numbers too, didn't have that bad of a career with the Red Sox. And Ended up amassing a 46 and 24 record with an ERA of 384. Very good for the three some odd years that he played with the team. And, uh, you know, you really got to be happy looking back at sort of what David Price was really able to do for this team, even though, you know, they signed him to big money and you expected a lot from him, especially, you know, what he did uh, during his career with the, with the Rays, the Blue Jays and the Tigers. Still got to be very grateful as a Red Sox fan that uh, Dave Dombrowski brought him over here and, you know, what David Price was able to do for the Red Sox. So, you know, David Price, to you, tip of my cap, great for career, not only with the Red Sox, but you know, as I mentioned, with the Rays, the Blue Jays, the Tigers, uh, and obviously now with the Dodgers. A lot of respect and uh, very grateful for what he was able to do in a Red Sox uniform. But that's going to be it for this episode of the Locked On Red Sox podcast. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, if you have not yet, make sure to follow us over on Twitter. It's LO underscore Red Sox. Myself on Twitter is at Jake Iggy. And also my co-host, Lauren, it's La La La, three laws. Lauren with four R's. But we greatly appreciate everybody tuning in. We're going, we are going to do our best to bring you 
uh, the most exciting and energetic content uh, throughout the rest of this Red Sox 2022 season. Even though, uh, you know, there's no hope anymore of them making the playoffs. We're going to be right on the same boat with you, just enjoying Red Sox baseball for the rest of this season and, uh, you know, doing our best to enjoy it to its fullest while we still have it. Because, you know, once the season ends, it's going to be really sad and a long wait uh, until April till we see Red Sox baseball once again. But as always, greatly appreciate everybody tuning in and we'll end it how we always end it. Let's go Sox.